Hello, good morning. Hi, I'm Evan Herr. I'm your vestry person of the day. My ministry is children and youth formation. I'll be at the back of the chapel after the service with uh, Hillary. If you have any comments or questions or thoughts, uh, please share them with us. If you are here for the first time, we welcome you. If you're a, a long-time visitor or member, we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Uh, if this is your first Sunday, then I'll encourage you to sign the guest book. That's in the, the narthex. And I've got three things to say. I'm going to say two of them and then uh, uh, speak with Laura Hunt here. And so I'm telling you that so that if I do only say two things, then halt me and, and don't let me leave. <laughs> and so, okay. Uh, we would like for people to sign up for Connections time. Uh, you can find a link in the bulletin or a, a, an address in the bulletin and on the HOCO website to sign up, or you could talk to Susan Bowes if you are interested in hosting Connections. Just uh, like the name has changed, Coffee Hour to Connections, there's very low pressure, just uh, whatever you'd like to bring to encourage people to uh, come right across the hallway to the parish hall after the service. That's one. Thank you, Jim. Two, you see these wonderful lilies around the holy table up front, and the altar guild would like you to take those away after the service today. Now, not yet. Don't run up right now. But uh, after the service, if they were all to leave, uh, that would be a great thing. And number three, I'll, I'll let Laura go, and then we'll add on. I'm Laura Hunt from the Creation Care Ministry. And this is Arnaldo Cardona, and you will see he has beautiful designs for a creation garden. <laughs> Those posters live on the bulletin board in the parish hall. Just pass Jesus as you walk on the left. Uh, you'll notice them. <laughs> So we're about to start a garden on the Monument Avenue side of the church, filled with native plants and pollinators to provide a home for birds, bees, and butterflies. The garden will be a welcome mat to the community and allow people walking or driving by to notice how beautiful our church is. We're hoping as many parishioners as possible will be involved in creating the garden. There's a green paper insert in your bulletin. You're welcome to take it out and look at it. It tells you about our plans and asks you to donate so we can buy the plants. Uh, you can donate money, you can also donate plants um, if they're on the list here, or you can even donate other supplies like gravel for the walk and peat moss and mulch. Um, and Together, we can, as a community, create a beautiful facade for HOKO. Um, the various categories, $10 will buy one plant, or you can be a hummingbird or a monarch butterfly if you donate uh, $250. Um, so, uh, we'll be celebrating Earth Day throughout the month of April and May. Our first garden work day will be on April 20th, the Saturday, uh, about 11 o'clock, and another one on May 5th. We hope to see you then. A final thing, as I came in this morning, Ann Snyder gave me a present. It's a green bed, and it says, with God, all things are possible, and it has many flowers on it. So this is my inspiration this morning. Thank you. And now. So just to add on, the May 5th date, we invite the children of HOKO after the service, so May 5th is a Sunday, after the service to come to the Monument Avenue garden and plant some of those plants and flowers. And so that means wearing, uh, in terms of your Sunday best, your hardiest uh, work clothes. I mean, for the children to wear clothes appropriate to plant flowers on that Sunday. That's three. Good morning, beloved. I am Lucius Chapin, the seminary intern coming to an end. 
but <laughs> um, I didn't know I would be helping out with announcements, but also I wanted to let you all know that those gift bags are for people who have, uh, who read uh, and participated in the Passion. So be sure to pick one up if, if you have done that. And I also want to express my amazement as, at what's already been done towards the community garden. It's, it's wonderful what you all have going on here uh, in that way. <laughs> it's not an end. It's, it's, it's a beginning of a new relationship with you all, right? Uh, no, truly, I will not be a stranger to this community. I, I know that in my heart. Uh, it's been a blessing for me. To that end, uh, I have mentioned that I uh, have a favor and request of you all um, to help me in my journey and to reflect on this year that we've had together. I've posed the question, who do we say we are? And I, um, some of you have already picked this up as you came in. If you have not, please, after the service, pick one up there back there. I'll try to be around them. It's really meant to be an open-ended reflection on who we, we as individuals and as community and as a church say we are. And how that informs us as Christians uh, and as a church. So you can either fill it out front and back here, it's a blank page on the back, and either give it to me or uh, um, maybe t drop it off at the office. But even possibly easier for some would be to just simply send me an email. And uh, the, the questions are here. I appreciate you all's time and that and you all's love as I've been here this year. Thank you all. Good morning. My name is Ernie Irby. And a couple of years ago, my daughter, Melinda Lee Irby, who lives in Buffalo, New York, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And she went to Roswell Park Cancer Hospital in Buffalo, and they operated on her pancreas. And the next year, the cancer spread into her lungs and they operated on her left lung and a few months later they operated on her right lung and for a little while she was cancer free but now the cancer has come back and because of the previous operations etc the doctors at Roswell Park decided to use chemotherapy rather than an operation. And Melinda told me a couple of days ago that when she gets the chemo and she can feel the chemicals pulsing through her bloodstream, she says she feels like she's being poisoned. And I said, well, yeah, you, you probably are. That some kind of poison in that is supposed to kill the cancer cells. So they're using some an experimental therapy on her, an immunotherapy that is supposed to build up her uh, immune system so that her own body can fight the cancer cells. And she said a few days ago, she was have, sitting in a chemo chair, receiving the chemicals, and she felt like uh, she was surrounded by warmth, and, and, and she wasn't anxious. She lost all of her anxiety, and, and, and she's so scared. She's so scared. <laughs> And, and uh, she felt surrounded. 
by warmth. And she said, it felt like the prayers from a holy comforter had surrounded her and it felt like arms hugging her. And she said, please tell the people at Holy Comforter, thank them for their prayers and tell them, don't stop. Keep praying. Keep praying for Melinda Lee Irby. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers. That is correct. Amen. Just to point out a couple of things in the bulletin, next Sunday, Bishop Stevenson, our diocesan bishop, is going to be here. And we are going to celebrate as well the confirmation of Dale, who was just baptized, and the reception of Arnaldo. So please join us next Sunday for this great celebration. And I'll let you read through all the other announcements. Welcome. There will be connection time today, thanks to Marie McGranahan Turner.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I invite the children who are here to come up, and we'll have a prayer. And Darlene Kleinsman is leading Children's Chapel today, and it's a super fun activity. She previewed it for me, so that'll be fun. Great. Let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for the children gathered in our group today, for all the children and youth of Holy Comforter and your children throughout the world. May they be filled with a sense of your resurrection joy, your new life, and know how important they are in your world to us, to you, and for everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as they had need. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. God. Let's read the psalm responsive by whole verse. How good and pleasant is it, it is when God's people live together in unity. It is, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore.
A reading from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. <clears throat> we, decide, we declare to you that what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is a message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
Holy Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. For then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord Jesus had said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them. And when Jesus, and when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the, mark of the, the marks of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples again in the, the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. We thank you, God, for this time that we share together in your presence, for your Holy Spirit with us. We give thanks for the resurrection of Jesus, for his eternal love for us. Guide us in all that we do, that it may be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, all right. Love Sunday, welcome. Faithful remnant, excellent. Good to see you today. I'm going to start at the end of the gospel reading, take a little stroll through Acts, and then come back to the fearful disciples and Thomas. We read at the very end of the gospel reading, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That through believing you may have life in his name. We hear what having life in Jesus' name can mean in our reading from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, 
for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the, proce the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. To have life in this way, this resurrection life now, is to know abundance. To be filled with that sense of God's love that you overflow with your own sense of abundance. To know this overflowing of light, this brings joy to our days and the desire to share that joy and light. Christianity in the abstract is really not that convincing. I mean, just look, just look around. It's not. But people sharing everything that they own because of their faith, their belief, their experience of the risen Christ, I bet that got some attention. Passages such as this from Acts inspired what's known as Christian socialism. Passages such as this, when quoted, caused some to say, that sounds like communism. Those first Christians were not following a doctrine, of course, as we know, but they were following Jesus, living in this new resurrection reality. Now, granted, they also thought that the end of time was right around the corner. And for a similar reason, the idea of not getting married and not having children was also taking hold in those early days of the way. But even now, the new life that we have in Christ is a countercultural one in many ways. And we do share a lot. We care about others even outside of our family or our circles because every person we know on earth is created in God's image, worthy of respect, worthy of our recognizing their dignity even when they are in this situation that seems to grant them no dignity of all, at all, but created in God's image. And we're all siblings. We're all in the same human family. For a long time, the church didn't seem so countercultural. We were in lockstep with capitalism in this country and politics and slavery, things like that as well, especially the Episcopal Church. And it was just sort of, I don't know, right? People from St. Paul's downtown would go and pray at the state capitol. Maybe they still do that. I'm not sure. But it was not unusual for clergy in the Episcopal Church to be invited into many political situations to offer prayers. Um, <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> we no longer hold that place in society so much. And I think that that may, in fact, be our salvation. That might be our salvation, but it's an adjustment, and not everyone's there yet. I've liked often not being in the richest church, not being in the biggest church, because we have to live in to this resurrection reality. We cannot rely on the trappings of society to make this work, and I think that's actually a blessing. To share eternal life with God now is to share in a different sort of reality, a different dimension. On the morning that the women went to the tomb and found that Jesus' body was not there, we hear it was the first day of the week, the first day of a new creation. Just as we read in Genesis, God began creation on the first day. So this is no accident that it was phrased this way. This new reality, a new dimension, one in which resurrection had happened, made the whole creation new. It was the first day of the week. I wonder what day of the week we're on right now. Hmm. And in today's gospel reading, we heard that it was the evening on that first day, the first day of the week. 
and the closest friends and students of Jesus were hiding out for fear of the religious authorities and I'm pretty sure the Roman soldiers as well. Just because it was the first day of the new creation, not everyone had experienced that yet. Just hearing about it was not enough. Too abstract, not concrete, unbelievable. Then Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Why did he say that? Uh, I mean, think about it, right? Of all the things, I'm back. They couldn't kill me, here I am. But he says, peace be with you. Maybe it's because all these guys deserted him when he was suffering on the cross. Maybe they felt a need for forgiveness and this giving of the peace was that sign, I love you, we are at peace. When we exchange the peace here in church, we're saying that through the grace of God, we can be at peace. Not because we're so great at forgiveness, not because we're so great at connection or belief, but because God is. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Every Sunday morning we say that, we hear that, and we are able to rejoice in the peace of God. And if that was not enough, I mean, that's kind of a miracle, right? Forgiveness is always a miracle. If that was not enough, Jesus gives them the hand-on experience. In his risen body, he still had the wounds. The pain was real, the death real. It left scars. What does it mean that our Savior has wounds? What does it mean to us, we who carry wounds, both visible and invisible? We who have family members going through cancer treatment, we who've been through cancer, we who have been through many, many things. It means Jesus knows our pain the wounds of our communities, of our bodies, of our nation, of our world. That's what it's always meant to me. And as I was preparing for this sermon today, I was reading once again the Salt Project commentary, and they make the point that the risen one having the wounds speaks to a doubt, that there are more doubts than just Thomas's doubt. One of the other doubts and I'm quoting here, was a doubt focused on whether Jesus was truly the Messiah. For the genuine Messiah, this thinking goes, would not raise from the dead in triumph, in splendor, but rather be a suffering servant, still marked by vulnerability, by fragility, by wounds. In short, the true Messiah acting on behalf of a wounded world would rise as a wounded savior. As a sign of authenticity then, Jesus immediately displays his hand and his side. God's beloved comes not as a military conqueror without blemish, but rather as a strong and peaceful shepherd bearing the wounds of the world a child of God and a child of humanity. Jesus is the word made flesh and flesh means vulnerability. Flesh means wounds. Then we get to Thomas. Rather than being labeled as doubting Thomas in some sort of negative way, I've never understood why that happened, right? Before I was part of a church, I knew about doubting Thomas and I always thought it was pretty negative and you would never wanna be called that. But think about it. We heard the story today. He asks for what the others had already experienced. He doesn't ask for anything different. He too wants to touch the wounds. And when I think of Thomas and in this way, I find grace. When I think of him in that negative way, I also think about how 
the church developed at some point a terrible culture that said, just believe, don't ask questions. Terrible. A huge reason I joined the Episcopal Church as an adult was the clear message that I received from Episcopal clergy and people in parishes that questions are good. God welcomes our questions. Can I get an amen to that? Amen, amen right? Yes. There was a poster, I'm sure many of you have been around the Episcopal Church for a while have seen it, a poster on the office of one of the clergy at St. Paul's Memorial Church uh, where I was attending, and it's a poster of the baptismal font, and the caption reads, he came to take away your sins, not your mind. And then I learned a lot from Jesuits over the years, from all the Jesuit retreats I went on. A, a key part of Ignatian spirituality is to ask for the grace you desire. That that's a good thing, to ask for the grace you desire. And that's what Thomas did. And Jesus came to him, if you read it a certain way, not with criticism, but with the grace he needed to believe. And what did that even mean at the time? It meant the grace to stay with the others, to be in community. What is belief? We see it in action. John's gospel then goes on to say, blessed are those, it, it says Jesus said, blessed are those who have seen, not seen, and believed. And then it says, okay, but hey, we've written all this down for you so you can believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and believed. We have to remember, right, a little exegetical knowledge, a little historical knowledge. Gos this gospel was written for people then and now who would never see visions, necessarily, of the resurrected Christ the way those first disciples did. It was written for them then and us now. Already those who were sharing the message of Jesus in the first decades after his death and resurrection, as they were starting to organize communities, they were facing the problem that people were going to have to believe without seeing. But Thomas can be our saint around all this. Like him, we can ask for the grace we need for our faith journey, whatever that is. God's got you. God knows you. Whatever we need, our faith journey that takes many twists and turns, has many questions, searching and doubting, all are a part of faith and life with God. And God is right there with us, where we are, not where maybe our parents wish we had been, others might wish, or what we might wish to be true, but God is with us where we actually are, right now, desiring our questions, longing to share with us the grace that we need. Amen. Please join me for the reading of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, and became truly human. 
For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and a life for the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you're for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Episcopal Anglican province of Alexandria. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Paul's Alexandria and Trinity Manassas. We pray for those who are nominated to be our next presiding bishop, Scott, Daniel, Sean, and Robert. We pray for our bishops, Mark and Gail, and for our presiding bishop, Michael. We pray for our parish clergy, clergy, Hillary, Joe, Bridget, Heather, Frank, and Bradley, and for our seminarian, Lucius. In the parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Susan, Tom, Dan, Cheryl. For healing in our parish, Bridget, Carlene, Fred, Susan, Mark, Gail, Marie, the Haas family, Bonnie, and Barbara. I invite your prayers silently or aloud. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated and I invite David and Bonnie to come forward. Actually, maybe you guys want to join me in this. We could do one of those gathering. Everybody can lay hands on them. We'll stay here in the middle. <laughs> All right, so I am so thrilled that we can pray for you as you are about to journey. Let us pray. This is great. God, you called your servants Abraham and Sarah out of the town of Ur in Chaldean, Chaldea, watching over them in all their wanderings, and you guided the Hebrew people through the desert. Guide these your children, David and Bonnie, 
to for the love of your name make a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Be for them their companion on the way, their guide at the crossroads, their strength in weariness, their defense in danger, their shelter on the path, their shade in the heat, their light in darkness, their comfort in discouragement, and the firmness of their intentions, that through your guidance they may arrive safely at the end of their journey and strengthened with and strengthened with gratitude and power, may return to their homes filled with grace and lasting joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. So Thank welcome. You. We're so excited for your trip. <laughs> Now we're going to exchange the peace, which I mentioned in the sermon. And, and as we do this, if anyone who has a birthday or an anniversary and you'd like a prayer, you can come up at any time. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you. Peace, peace, peace. Today is also Good Samaritan Sunday. Woohoo! And if you brought bags of food, you're welcome to bring that up basically at any time. <laughs> Birthday. Remind me of the day. Okay, cool. Should I mention that? Laura will be 77 on Thursday. <laughs> Let us pray. We thank you, God, for Laura, for her life shared with us and all in her, in her life, her family, her friends, her communities. I pray that this year she will know you even more and more and know your deep, deep love for her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And Joe's having a birthday on Tuesday. Yeah. Do you want to share your age? 63. 63. Dear God, thank you for Joe, our faithful, loving deacon here at Holy Comforter, and for the amazing man that he is in all his life and his family and many communities that he participates in and serves. May he know your love more and more, the deepness of your care for him and your thankfulness that he is your deacon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yep. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, everybody. And food. We're bringing up food. Excellent.
We give thanks for all the food donated today and for those who've donated it. We pray uh, for those who will receive it and for an end to hunger in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who is sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves, and we would not see your goodness in the world around us. So we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You, you delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your children, that with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray to God, who is our divine parent, our mother, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ rose for you and invite him into your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please join me in our post-communion prayer found at the bottom of page eight in your bulletin. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the wounded and risen Christ fill you and be with you every day, every step you take. And the blessing of God ever loving, creator, Christ, and holy comforter be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, hallelujah. God is good.